Today on America's Test Kitchen, Lon makes Bridget stir-fried beef and gylon. Adam reveals his top picks for bamboo steamers. And Dan makes Julia congee. It's all coming up right here on America's Test Kitchen. We all know the Chinese American menu item, stir fry beef and broccoli. I happen to love it, but I'm really excited because Lon's here and she's come with a much earlier version that features Gai Lan or Chinese broccoli. Really want to find out more about this recipe, but I know you had a pretty amazing conversation. I did. I was looking for an expert to talk to to learn how to make this dish, and I put out a call to one of my childhood cooking heroes, Martin Yan. Um, I grew, yeah, I grew up watching Yan Can Cook. We chatted, he was super generous, and I can't wait to show you what he taught me. So we're gonna start with the beef, and when you look at the more modern recipes, they're calling for a pound, maybe 12 ounces of flank steak. Mm. I'm going back to a more veg-heavy version. Great. We're only using eight ounces of beef here. We're using an eight ounce center cut filet mignon, and I'm going to start by cutting it into quarters. It's such a soft and tender cut that it's really hard to slice thinly. Yes. So we're gonna pop it in the freezer just to firm it up. It'll take about 20 to 25 minutes. Okay. All right, now that the beef is in the freezer, let's prep our gylon. Okay. We're gonna start by cutting the leaves from the stalk. And I'm just gonna cut the leaves into one and a half inch wide pieces. If there are any bits of stem or floret, they'll all go into that same bowl. Great. The stalks, I'm going to cut on the bias into quarter inch thick pieces. And I like to use kind of a steep angle. I think you just get larger pieces that are more fun to eat. So now we just need to wait for that beef to firm up and then we'll continue. All right, Bridget, it's been 20 minutes. This is nice and firm. Sure is. Now I'm gonna set these on one of the cut sides. It doesn't really matter which one. And I'm looking for quarter inch thick slices. I've got pretty good knife skills, but I would not try to do this without par freezing the meat. Right. Some of these are a little bit wider or narrower than others, but the cook time is really dependent on how thick they are. So we just wanna make sure they're quarter of an inch thick. To marinate this beef, I've got three ingredients. It's really simple. I've got a teaspoon of soy sauce, a teaspoon of cornstarch, and a teaspoon of a Chinese rice wine called Shaoxing. The two liquids are seasoning the beef, and the cornstarch is kind of helping that liquid to cling mm. to the meat. It'll offer some protection when we go to cook this. And it's really just a matter of mixing until everything is well coated. Last up, because it's a stir fry, we have to prep all the other ingredients. Once we start cooking, there is no stopping and running around. Okay. I've got four teaspoons of vegetable oil here, and I'm going to add one and a half teaspoons of grated ginger and a quarter teaspoon of minced garlic. This oil is gonna flavor the beef later on, and I just wanna have it ready so that we're not waiting on it. Last up is our sauce. It starts with a half a cup of chicken broth, to that, I'm adding one of the most important ingredients to beef and broccoli, and that's oyster sauce. I've got two tablespoons of it. Next up, I've got four teaspoons of Shaoxing, so more of that wine. It's kind of a little bit like mirin, not as mm. sweet, a little funkier. Two teaspoons of soy sauce, one teaspoon of cornstarch, that's gonna thicken our sauce, and a half a teaspoon of sesame oil, just for a little pop of flavor. I love toasted sesame oil. Oh. Quick whisk, we're ready to cook. All right, Bridget, I've got a 14 inch flat bottom carbon steel wok here. I'll crank the heat to high. And unlike some of the Western recipes we do, where we start with some oil in the pan and we wait for it to smoke or shimmer, when you're working with a traditional wok, there's already a film of oil in there because we're not washing it with a ton of soap and water. Right. And so the pan itself will start smoking when it's ready. We don't have to start with any oil. You can actually see some smoke coming up from the wok right now. Let's start. Okay. I've got a teaspoon of oil here and I'm going to add our stalks first. I'm looking for these to get tender, spotty brown, but not soft. I wanna keep the food moving in the wok because it's super hot at the bottom and it won't cook evenly if it's just sitting still. Can you smell this? Absolutely. What is happening right now is we're generating a little bit of wok hay. It is super important in Cantonese cooking to have that kind of smoky, grilly flavor. And it comes from 
the cooking method and the wok itself. And the term itself, wake, was coined by Grace Young. Um, she was also super generous in sharing her thoughts about this recipe. So how long for this? Three to four minutes. Okay. As Alon mentioned, cooking food in a seasoned hot wok imparts the legendary savor of wake, which means breath of the wok or spirit of the wok. But what exactly is this complex culinary phenomenon? The fragrance of wake can be primarily attributed to numerous flavor compounds that form when oil gets hot. When food containing moisture, like vegetables or noodles, is tossed in a hot wok set over a flame, the water rapidly evaporates, launching tiny particles of oil into the air. As the oil passes through the air over the edge of the wok, it breaks down and can even ignite, forming smoky, metallic, briny, complex aroma compounds that flavor the food. With repeated use, those compounds get embedded in a seasoning layer. Now, the wok itself contains the wok hay flavor, and when that seasoning gets hot, a bit of that flavor transfers to food. The scientific quest to fully understand wake is ongoing, but this recipe will ensure that you get a breath of it at home. How great does that look? I wanna get them out of here so they don't keep cooking. Lovely bit of color there. Yeah. Now that the stalks are done, let's move on to the leaves. I've got a teaspoon of vegetable oil, and to that I'm adding one teaspoon of sesame oil, just to flavor it, and a half a teaspoon of minced garlic. Now this is gonna go fast. It's only gonna take 15 seconds before the garlic is toasty, and I wanna keep moving it around. Oh yeah. I'm just looking for it to pick up some color and smell good. Now we'll add our leaves. Mm. I'm not looking to fully cook this. I'm looking for the leaves to get kind of a dark jade green. This will take about 45 seconds for all of these leaves to wilt down. All right, so this, this color is looking great. You can yeah. see the waxiness has gone away. But to finish cooking it, I'm gonna add a quarter cup of chicken broth. Mm -hmm. Now what I want is to cook all of that liquid off. I don't want that broth to kind of dilute our sauce mm -hmm. and thin it out. So. This will take two to three minutes to kind of dry it out. You can see this is really dry and the leaves have really collapsed down. Now I'm gonna land these on our serving platter. This was another one of those things that Martin mentioned. He said he'd had a couple of versions of this dish where instead of tossing all of the ingredients together, people would make a bed from the leaves and then pour the sauce and the beef on top. Mm. And not only does it look great, the dish actually eats better when you do it this way. What happens is the leaves are kind of folded up and scrunched up right now. When we pour the sauce on top, you get the perfect amount of sauce uh, in the leaves. When you toss those leaves in the sauce, they kind of become sponges and they're coated in too much sauce and every bite is a little squidgy. A little sloppy. Yeah. Okay. Um, so last up, we're gonna cook our beef and I've got that flavoring oil we made earlier with the ginger and garlic. It's just gonna go right in. It'll take about 20 seconds for this to become fragrant because there's a little bit more stuff. And I'm just gonna add our beef and we'll just move this around. It's only gonna take maybe 90 seconds for this to cook. So I really wanna move it around and break it up. So we're getting close here. You'll notice that most of the pink is gone and I'm really just looking for all of that pink to go away. That oyster sauce is bringing so much savoriness and it's hard to see in this dark wok, but there's some fond building up in there and that's gonna flavor the sauce and that's really what we're after. So this looks great. I'm gonna return our stocks to this. Mm add our sauce yes. give it a quick stir to get that cornstarch off the bottom right <laughs> I know it looks kind of soupy right now but this is enough sauce for the beef and the leaves so it's gonna look a little soupy here but it's the right amount and I just want that cornstarch to thicken that usually takes just 30 to 60 seconds you can see how it's already picked up a gloss it's not as fluid anymore we're done that's it Ugh. All right, here we go. So, you ready to eat? I am so ready to eat. Oh. Look at this, this is stunning. You know what the best part about stir fries is? You have to serve them immediately. Yes! Can I serve you? Please. Now, I grew up eating this with jasmine rice and it is kind of my preferred rice for stir fries. Mm -hmm. This looks spectacular. <laughs> I'm going in. Mm crisp and crunchy. Mm -hmm. 
but definitely cooked, mm -hmm. not raw. What a great flavor, though. Yeah. It's that carbonized, that, that, that essence that you were talking about, the wok hay. It's hard to describe. It um, really is. I spoke to a, a food historian who said, it's like a rainbow. You'll know it when you see it. Mm. I love that nutty, sweet flavor of the gailan. All right, the beef. Yeah. This would be the pot of gold at the end of that rainbow. Buttery, tender. Yeah. The sauce. It has my favorite sauce in it, the oyster sauce. That's the wonder sauce. It somehow makes the beef beefier and the gailan taste sweeter mm. for it. It's a great combo. There's something lovely about going back to this more traditional approach that is more savory. It doesn't have the sweetness of onion or bell pepper. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but you know, change it up a little. It's nice. Thanks, Lon. This is absolutely perfection. We have Martin to thank. <laughs> Get to stir fry with a little help from your friends. And Lon certainly called upon some of the greats for help with this recipe. And it starts by cutting par frozen filet mignon into thin slices. Cook the gailan stalks first until browned, and then cook gailan leaves until they're vibrant and green. And of course, it's that beautiful super sauce that holds everything together. So from America's Test Kitchen, a wondrous version of beef and broccoli, it's stir fried beef and gailan. At America's Test Kitchen, recipe development is serious business. Head over to americastestkitchen.com and unlock 14,000 expert developed recipes and 8,000 unbiased product reviews, all rigorously tested by our team. Access every episode of every season of your favorite cooking shows. That's 38 seasons of inspiration. And with the ATK Members app, you'll have 30 years of expertise at your fingertips anywhere, anytime. Join us and become a smarter cook. Start your free all-access trial membership at americastestkitchen.com today. Bamboo steamers have been used for thousands of years and with good reason. They work with a wide variety of foods, they're relatively inexpensive, and they're made from bamboo, which is a sustainable resource. And today Adam's going to show us what to look for when buying a new one. These are super useful. Mm -hmm. If you've gone to dim sum, you have seen these deployed by the squadron mm -hmm. because they're used for dumplings, they're used for those bao buns. They come in a lot of different sizes. We chose a lineup of five yeah. here, they're in a 10 inch round size size, which is compatible with, say, a 12-inch skillet like we have here or a 14-inch wok. Mm -hmm. Put a little water on the bottom, the steamer goes on top, the steam rises. They come in tiers. We have some that have two tiers, like that one down on the end, or say this one has two tiers. Mm -hmm. And then that one in front of you has three tiers. Also, one thing that we really like about these is you can see the bottom is flat. Yep. So if you're cooking something delicate that could get bent or broken in the curved interior of a collapsible metal steamer, like yep. fish fillets, these work really well. They're a natural material and they do pick up odors. So you always line the tiers. Mm -hmm. I have some parchment liners here. I want to throw on in. I've actually never bought these. I didn't know they made these. I've been making them myself with parchment and a pair of scissors. <laughs> <laughs> this is a cool product. I'm going to gift you a pack of these. You know, a lot of people will use cabbage leaves yeah. or lettuce leaves also. So we tested these with dumplings and bao, those filled buns, in two tiers for the dumplings, three if we could, bao in one tier. Cleaning was a very important part of the mm -hmm. testing because this is a natural material, they absorb those odors, so you do wanna clean them out. You wanna dry it carefully and then separate the tiers so that they air dry more and that should help you avoid cracking and mold and getting it all misshapen and out of alignment. In the testing, these all were pretty comparable in terms of their steaming performance a little less comparable in terms of structural integrity. Interesting. And by that, I mean this. If it wasn't well made, some of these began to sort of lose their alignment. They yep. didn't fit together quite as well. Mm -hmm. It didn't affect the steaming performance. It just made them a little irritating <laughs> to use. The ones that stayed in alignment better were the ones down in front of you. You can see they have those metal bands that really help them retain their shape. Another structural issue arose. Again, I'll show you this one. You can see that the inside is made up of slats. And in this case, they're tied together with bamboo threads. Mm -hmm. Over the course of the testing, some of these threads began to fray. And you know, we thought that they would end up trashed after a couple of years. That one in front of you, 
Look at those oh, nice yeah. thick wooden slats. Yeah. And they're glued together. Again, much better structural integrity there. So those two are our winners. The one down at the very end, that is the Juvel 10 inch bamboo steamer with steel rings, $24 two tiers, worked beautifully, stayed well aligned through the whole thing. If you're steaming for a crowd and you want an extra tier, we have a three-tiered winner, and that's the H Cooker three-tier kitchen bamboo steamer with stainless steel banding, and that yeah. one is $43. So there you have it. If you're in the market for a new bamboo steamer, check out the Juvail 10-inch bamboo steamer with steel rings. Or if you're steaming for a crowd, check out the H Cooker three-tier kitchen bamboo steamer with stainless steel banding. Are you ready to take your cooking to the next level? Introducing the complete America's Test Kitchen TV show cookbook. Featuring every recipe from every episode of America's Test Kitchen. That's thousands of recipes. That texture is unbelievable. Reviews. Gadgets you didn't know you needed. And tips. Yes, there's some terrible choices, but there are also some amazing choices. <laughs> <laughs> We've spilled all of our secrets and included our insider notes alongside each recipe. Plus, there's a handy shopping guide so you know exactly what to grab when you're at the store. And of course, it makes an excellent gift. Get your copy today at americastestkitchen.com. Cooking rice down into a hearty porridge is a classic technique found all over East and Southeast Asia. And kanji is a great example of this. And Dan, you're a huge fan of kanji. I am, I really love it. So I'm a huge rice fan in general. And I think kanji speaks to the versatility of rice. You can make it sticky and you know, perfectly tender individual grains, or you can cook it down into a comforting porridge. So I'm gonna start with our rice here and I have three quarters of a cup of jasmine. Okay. So even within the rice, there's a lot of variation. Traditionally, a lot of it was made with broken rice. So when you process rice, not every, every grain comes out perfectly like this. Mm -hmm. Some of it's broken and that's already really broken down so it cooks a lot quicker that way. But of course, people often use whole rice for this and specifically to make kanji. Um, I just love jasmine for how aromatic it is. Mm -hmm. You use long grain and there's you know other rices that are used as well. Okay. So the first step is we're going to rinse our rice. So the rinsing is an important step. You know, rinsing rice in general is a really good thing to do. Mm -hmm. Here we have plenty of starch in the rice itself. So we're not short on, short on starch at all. Gotcha. The exterior starch can cause some foaming while we're cooking it. And you can get boil overs, which you know, I'm sure you've experienced with oatmeal and that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. So this actually helps prevent that. Interesting. So that looks good. It's running clear. I like to shake it and then give it a few good drops like this. Just make sure we've gotten that water off. And we transfer it over to our big Dutch oven. I'm going to start by adding a cup of chicken broth. Just a cup. Just a cup. So a little bit of chicken broth adds some nice meatiness and depth. And next I'm going to add, there's a little bit of salt in the chicken broth, but I'm going to add three quarters of a teaspoon. Next up, I have nine cups of water. That's a lot of water. A lot of now water. I get why I use the big pot. Yep, you need the big pot for it. I'm just gonna bring this up to a boil over high heat. So the kanji is up to a boil here. We're gonna reduce the heat. We want a vigorous simmer here. We're actually gonna cook this a fairly long time. Kanji is often cooked for 90 minutes, sometimes even more. And it's really, again, a personal preference thing of how much you want the rice to break down. You can cook the rice until it blossoms like a flower is one mm. descriptor for it. You can also cook it until almost no grains are visible. So mm. we're gonna go something a little bit more in the middle there. So we're gonna do a vigorous simmer to speed things up. A gentle simmer, it could take a really long time. And boiling can be good too, you see that a lot, but you can get boil overs, right? And so what we wanna do is eliminate those. So we're gonna use the lid here, but we're gonna put a wooden spoon in like ah. that. So we're gonna have a little bit of space for water to evaporate. And we're gonna do this for about 45 to 50 minutes until it's really silky and tender, and I'll show you what that looks like. Okay. To turn rice into kanji, you have to cook it for a lot longer than you would if you were making, say, a pilaf or even risotto. To explain, let's take a closer look inside a grain of rice. Each grain of rice contains hundreds of thousands of starch granules, each one made up of long, tightly packed starch molecules. As the rice cooks, those granules start to absorb water and swell, and the water pushes the starch molecules apart. This is called gelation. During this process, some of the starch molecules leach out of the granules and onto the surface of the rice. This is what causes grains of rice to stick to each other. With continued cooking, some of the granules burst entirely, releasing their starch. Risotto is an example of rice cooked to this point. As more granules burst, the starch fills the cooking liquid. The long starch molecules tangle with each other, making the liquid viscous. And it's at this point that the rice has turned into congee. Eggs are a really common topping for kanji. 
I think probably the most traditional is the thousand year egg, mm. which is really tasty and wonderful, kind of chopped up on top. But you see hard boiled eggs, you even see raw eggs sometimes. We're gonna make some jammy eggs. Jammy eggs. Yeah, so they're like partway between a soft cooked egg and a hard boiled egg. <laughs> and that yolk is like thick and creamy. It's mm. really, really nice. So I have a half inch of water in this pot here and it's boiling and I'm gonna drop my eggs in, not drop them, I'm gonna place them in really carefully. It's not a lot of water. It's not a lot of water. So it's not even covering the eggs. Nope, not at all. So we're gonna cover this up and we're gonna cook them for eight minutes here. Yeah. Starting them in the hot water like this is key, it's gonna make them a lot easier to peel. All right, that's been eight minutes. Take the lid off there. And we're gonna pop over to the sink here. All right. So I'm gonna drain the water off and run some cold water over them. That's gonna help stop the cooking, but it really just makes them easier to handle. I find if you're running them underwater, you can pretty easily peel them while they're out here. Yeah, this is just gonna come right off. We'll pop them in this bowl and we're gonna work on another topping. Okay. We're gonna make some fried shallots. Mm. We're gonna use a microwave technique, which I really like a lot. So I'm starting with three shallots that have been sliced thin. If you have a mandolin, this is a great time to use it. It doesn't have to be super, super thin, but they all need to be pretty equal so that they cook at the same rate. That makes sense. To that, I'm gonna add a half cup of vegetable oil. Any neutral oil is fine here. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna go into the microwave for about five minutes. Okay, that has been five minutes, and you can see that the shallots have shrunk down below the level of the oil. That's good, it means we're deep frying. I'm giving a quick stir just to even out the temperature, and I'll go back into the microwave now for another two minutes. I'm gonna repeat the stirring and microwaving every two minutes until they're starting to get golden brown. About six minutes. Ooh, these are starting to look really good. So it's been about six minutes. We want them to be a little bit more brown, but I'm gonna drop the intervals to 30 seconds because it goes super fast at this point. At Cooks Illustrated, we're food nerds. That's why every recipe we develop involves research, cooking science, and rigorous testing by our team of expert test cooks before being tested by our dedicated community of 40,000 home cooks. Only the highest rated recipes earn a place in our award-winning magazine. Every issue features our latest recipes and discoveries, cooking tips, and equipment and ingredient reviews. Our step-by-step -step photos and hand-drawn illustrations show you exactly how to succeed. What you won't see, even a single page of advertising. We've worked for home cooks like you for over 30 years. So, are you ready to become the best cook you know? Subscribe to Cooks Illustrated Magazine at cooksillustrated.com today. Beautiful. Goodness, those smell good. Don't they? Now the key is to get them out of here right away. They can go from beautiful to burnt pretty quickly. Ah. So what's interesting is they come out really soft even at that point, and they don't get crispy until they cool down. Aha. While they're still soft like this, that's when you want to hit them with some salt. All right, those look beautiful. Delicious. So it's been about 50 minutes, our rice is done, and you can see it's turned into this really luscious texture. So we burst a ton of starch granules, and all that liquid around it, you can see, is really thickened and beautiful. It's really nice. Yeah, this is just pure comfort food, so good. Right. Look at all these toppings. Yeah, so we have lots of toppings to choose from. So we have some chili oil here, we have mm -hmm. some soy sauce and some black vinegar, cilantro, scallion, ginger. Ooh, I'm gonna copy you. All right, so I'm gonna do one half an egg. You can go even more if you want. All right. I'm gonna do a little scallion, a little bit of julienne ginger, which adds tons of freshness. And we also got some chopped roasted peanuts, which are really nice. Mm. And some fried shallots. Oh yeah. All right, and I'm just gonna go with a little bit of black vinegar on mine, just to, just to brighten it up. All right, let's dig in. All right. Mmm. Mmm. That's delicious. That's so good. You know, you said comfort food earlier. I get it now. I could easily tuck into a big bowl of this if I was feeling a little under the weather. Totally. Or on a rainy day. Yep. And you haven't tried your jammy egg yet. I so haven't. I gotta have a little bit of that. That's so much richness. All right, here we go. Mmm. Mmm. I really love this. It's really good, right? Yeah, thank you for showing me how to make it. You're so welcome. So if you want to make a big bowl of comforting congee, start with a high ratio of water to rice, cook for almost an hour at a vigorous simmer, and top it with whatever you like, which in our case means jammy eggs and fried shallots. From America's Test Kitchen, a soothing and savory recipe for congee. You can find this recipe and all the recipes from this season, along with select episodes and our product reviews at our website, americastestkitchen.com slash TV. 
We hope you enjoyed this video as much as we enjoyed making it. Don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe to our channel. And if you're ready to take your cooking to the next level, head over to americastestkitchen.com and get a free all-access trial membership. While you're there, you can sign up for our free email newsletters and download our app. With unlimited access to over 14,000 of our Test Kitchen recipes and 8,000 product reviews, you'll have everything you need to cook and learn. So I asked, what are you waiting for? <laughs> Let's make something great together.